God didn't just save us from sin and death. That is the that is the one negative side of it. He saved us from something. He also saved us for something. He saved us for a life of beauty and power and purpose. In our worst moments, when we wonder about our purpose and our value and our significance, in those moments, let's push back the voice of the enemy who's trying to make us feel worthless and hear the voice of God saying, you are my masterpiece. You were created to bring a blessing to this world. You are my beloved in whom I am well pleased. Don't ever let go of that promise that you are God's masterpiece. Don't ever believe anything less about yourself. Your value has been set, past tense, has been set by your creator and it cannot be changed. All right, good morning. I want to start off uh, our time together with a story from the Old Testament. Um, God comes to a guy named Abraham, and he tells Abraham, I want you to leave the land that you're currently in, and I want you to go. But he doesn't tell him where to go. He just says, go, leave your land and go to a place uh, that I will show you. And Abraham is, is faithful. He believes God. He takes God at his word and, and he moves out. And in the process, God makes a covenant with Abraham and says that I will bless you richly. I will make your name famous. I will basically, the, all of the world essentially will become descendants of yours. And you know that there's some crazy situations within this. Abraham is a well advanced in age and him and his wife have not been able to have children. And there's some wavering on their part a little bit. The stuff gets off track, but ultimately uh, Abraham is blessed by God and his wife with a, with a child named Isaac. And this covenant that God makes with Abraham, this blessing that God has promised to pour out on Abraham passes from Abraham down to Isaac. And then Isaac gets married. And Isaac has a couple of boys of his own. In fact, these are their twins. Maybe you're familiar with their names. They're Jacob and Esau. So it's Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And you don't hear a lot about Esau, but he had a twin brother. Or Jacob had a twin brother named Esau. And they're twins. But Esau actually came out first. Now, by how much, we don't know. Uh, we know that it was pretty much uh, just a second or two earlier because we know that Jacob was actually holding on to Esau's ankle when, Jake, when Esau came out, meaning he was probably trying to like pull him back, bring him back in. The reason for that is because even though they were twins, the fact that Esau came out first meant that he would receive a larger portion of the inheritance that he would actually receive his father's blessing. And so even though Jacob was a couple seconds or minutes or whatever behind him, he was going to miss out on several things as a result of being just a little bit, a little bit late. So you probably know a little bit at least about how the story goes. They kind of grow up, and Jacob is definitely a mama's boy, and Esau is really rugged. It says that he's hairy and he's just a hunter, and he's just a man's man, that kind of thing. And Jacob is just kind of more like chill, just a homebody, you know, that kind of thing. But Jacob has a, a kind of a unique trait. Uh, it actually is reflected by his name. His name, Jacob in Hebrew, means uh, the, the supplanter or the one who tricks, the one who deceives. And so Jacob is really good at basically strategy and manipulation and figuring things out. He's kind of definitely the wiser of the two. So Esau's like all, all man, not really much brain, you know, and, and Jacob is just a little bit wiser. So you know that there's a story where Esau comes in from hunting and he's famished. And he's just beside himself with hunger. As Emily said, he's hangry, right? He's not thinking clearly. He doesn't have his wits about him. And Jacob is able to get Esau to agree to trade part of his birthright. So he's sacrificing the larger portion of the inheritance. He's willing to switch inheritances, right, for a bowl of beans. Not the best trade ever, not the best trade. So Esau's like, I don't care. What good is my inheritance if, I can't, if I'm not alive? Give me some food and you can have the larger share of the inheritance. So Jacob does that. Now, it goes on that on top of stealing Esau's birthright or tricking him out of the larger portion of the inheritance, Jacob also 
is in cahoots with his mom, who favors him heavily to actually also steal the fatherly blessing from Esau. So he's already got the inheritance. Now he's going to take the blessing. We're going to talk about that here in a second. And he does a whole bunch of stuff to, to trick his father Isaac, who is at this point nearing the end of his life, and that's when the blessing would pass from father to eldest son. And Isaac, we're told, is, is blind. He is near death. His sensitivities are dulled. And Jacob, again, works with his mother to trick Isaac out of, or to trick Esau out of the blessing and to get Isaac to pronounce the blessing over himself, over Jacob, instead of Esau. And this happens. Jacob wears some animal skins that are really like furry and hairy. So when his father feels him, he thinks it's Esau, which I mean, how hairy did that dude have to be? It's like, come on, man, you know? It's like he shaves in the morning and that's a shave again at night. Um, one of those types of things. I've known some guys like that. but um, And he, he kind of even tries to alter his voice a little bit and does some different stuff. And it works. And Isaac puts his hand uh, on Jacob's head and passes this blessing. So this is where we pick up the story. This has just happened. And it says in Genesis 27, 30 through 38. It's on the screen here. After Isaac finished blessing him, and Jacob had scarcely left his father's presence. So this has just happened. His brother Esau came in from hunting. And he too prepared some tasty food and brought it to his father. Then he said to him, my father, please sit up and eat some of my game so that you may give me your blessing. So Esau's done all this work to prepare to receive the blessing that's rightfully his. His father Isaac asked him, who are you? I'm your son, he answered, your firstborn Esau. And Isaac trembled violently and said, Who was it then that hunted game and brought it to me? I ate it just before you came, and I blessed him, and indeed he will be blessed. When Esau heard his father's words, he burst out with a loud and bitter cry and said to his father, Bless me, me too, my father. But he said, your brother came deceitfully and took your blessing. And Esau said, and here you go, isn't he rightly named Jacob, the one who deceives, the one who supplants? This is the second time he's taken advantage of me. He took my birthright, and now he's taken my blessing. And then he asked, haven't you reserved any blessing for me? And Isaac answered Esau, I have made him Lord over you. And have made all his relatives his servants. And I have sustained him with grain and new wine. So what can I possibly do for you, my son? And Esau said to his father, Do you only have one blessing, my father? Bless me too, my father. And then Esau wept aloud. And this is a heavy, heavy scene. So you might be wondering, what's the big deal here, though, Esau? Like, your inheritance, I get that part. But this isn't, is this just like a prayer? Isn't this just a prayer over you? Why are you so upset? Why are you weeping bitterly? Why are you crying out loud? Why are you so messed up by the fact that you didn't receive this blessing? Well, in the Old Testament, the blessing that was handed down from a father to a son— especially in this line from Abraham to Isaac and Isaac to Jacob. It wasn't just some kind of perfunctory prayer. It wasn't just some sort of like going through the motions type of thing at the end of the father's life. There was a supernatural element to it. There was an actual physical, tangible, manifest blessing that was passed from father to son. And you see that reflected, right, in Esau's behavior and also even in Isaac's words where he says, I have made him Lord over you, right? Something was passed and all of his relatives, servants, like I've elevated him to a new status. And I can't I take it back now. It's that supernatural impartation. Something has passed. It's been transferred and I can't, I can't bring it back. It's a big, big deal. God made a covenant, covenant excuse me, with Abraham, who then passes it to Isaac. Isaac blesses Jacob instead of Esau. And then we know where it goes from there. Right? Jacob is blessed by God 
even though he is a deceiver, a supplanter, a manipulator, a conniver, all these things, because of the power and the significance of the blessing, Jacob is blessed by God. He wrestles with him at one point, and then God changes his name from Jacob to Israel. I mean, God's chosen people, God's holy nation set apart, right, comes from this guy, Jacob. <laughs> and he becomes Israel, and then he blesses all 12 of his sons who become the 12 tribes of Israel. It's a, good, it's a crazy story, isn't it? All of these blessings that we're talking about, from God to Abraham, the covenant, Abraham to Isaac, the passing of the blessing, Isaac to Jacob, and then Jacob to his 12 sons through the blessing. All of these things foreshadow the blessing that I want to focus on this morning. It's what we witness in Matthew's gospel. And I've said this many times before, but you cannot understand the New Testament without the Old Testament. You just can't. You're going to miss so much of the richness, so much of the significance, so much context. So all those blessings in the Old Testament foreshadow this blessing that we're going to witness Today, what Matthew describes is Jesus receiving the blessing from his father, who just happens to be God. We can't underestimate the significance of this blessing, but also Jesus, we know, comes from the line of David, who was from the line of Abraham. So we have this blessing, Abraham to Isaac, Isaac to Jacob, Jacob to the 12 tribes, David the great king David's line now to Jesus, and Jesus receives this blessing. In Matthew 3, and I think this will give some new richness to this story that maybe you weren't familiar with prior to this morning. We're talking about here about the baptism of Jesus. In Matthew 3, 13 through 17, it says, Then Jesus came from Galilee to the Jordan to be baptized by John. But John tried to deter him, saying, I need to be baptized by you. And do you come to me? Jesus replied, let it be so now. It is proper for us to do this to fulfill all righteousness. And then John consented. As soon as Jesus was baptized, he went up out of the water. And at that moment, heaven was opened. And he saw the Spirit of God descending like him and alighting on him or landing on him. And a voice from heaven said, Here's the blessing. A voice from heaven said, This is my son, whom I love. With him I am well pleased. Keep in mind that up until this point in his life, roughly 30 years, we're pretty much unaware of Jesus' activities. We have one story from his youth when he was 12 years old, and that's it. And it's safe to assume that while he was clearly ahead of the curve in some ways, probably academically, he was pretty much considered to be your average Jewish boy, your average Jewish man. We know this is true because of the reactions of the people, including his own family, when he began to teach, when he began to go to the synagogues, when he began to do miracles, to drive out demons, to make certain claims we know that they considered him just a normal guy. In fact, they talk about this. Isn't, isn't this Jesus? Isn't this, Mary? isn't this Joseph's son? Isn't this just the guy that we grew up with? I mean, he, just a normal, he's just one of us. But when he's baptized, so he's normal, but when he's baptized at the age of 30, and the Spirit descends on him in the form of a dove, and the voice of God speaks you have all forms of the Trinity present. You have the Son. You have the Holy Spirit coming down in the form of the dove. And you have the Father speaking. In this moment, Jesus is not only given a blessing. This is my beloved Son, whom I am well pleased. But also his identity. His identity. He is, who is he? He is the beloved Son of God. In whom God is well pleased. It's a pretty big deal. He is the beloved son of God. Let's talk for the rest of our time together this morning about the issue of identity. You know, as simple as I can say it, our identity is everything. Our identity is everything. 
I'm going to unpack that a lot as we go forward, but I can't stress this enough. Who we believe ourselves to be has incredible significance and impact, not only in our lives, but on the lives of those around us. Who we believe to be, who we believe ourselves to be, who we know ourselves to be, it doesn't just impact our lives it impacts those around us, those who interact with us, our friends, our family, our coworkers. We're in the middle of this series right now called Jesus. And this is the last week of this particular section called Become Like Jesus. So when I talk about identity, I'm talking about it from this place of us becoming like Jesus. What do I mean? Jesus knew who he was. Jesus knew who who he was. And if we're to become like Jesus, we must know who we are. Jesus knew who he was. And if we're to become like him, we must know who we are. If you don't know who you are, any effort you make to become like Jesus will be purely human effort. Any effort you make to become like Jesus without knowledge of your identity in Christ and who you are will be futile, will be frustrating. Will probably, you'll get to a point where you just can't even, you don't even want to move forward anymore because you feel like you've made this so much effort, so much attempt, and you've expended so much energy and all these things and trying to become like Jesus, but you're going to be like, I don't know that I've moved any closer to it. But when you know who you are, and you start to understand that, which we're going to talk about again the rest of this morning, and you start to think about becoming like Jesus, and you allow the Holy Spirit to do what the Holy Spirit wants to do, the frustration is definitely more minimal, way more minimal. You actually believe that you are being molded, conformed, shaped into the image and likeness of Jesus. But we live in a world right now where everyone is searching for their identity. We've talked about this so much here. Everybody is trying to identify themselves in some way or align themselves with some group. And there's also this myth of individuality, that somehow you are individual, that you are apart from everybody else in some way, and that what your job kind of to do is to figure out who you are But the problem is you're trying to figure out who you are apart from all these other contexts. So you're trying to say, well, I'm going to express myself and I'm going to do X, Y, and Z in order to express myself and show my individuality and show my personality and all that stuff. But it ends up being very vacuous and very hollow and very empty. Because who you are is not something that just stands alone. You just can't isolate yourself, remove yourself from bigger contexts and expect to figure that out. We're all part of a shared humanity. And our identity is so linked together, right? We see this kind of stuff, even this myth of individuality, and I'm not trying to pick on anybody at all in any way, shape, or form. I'm just trying to explain it. And I've been, I don't want to say a victim, but I've been a participant or had this way of thinking in the past. But it's like you go out and you're like, I'm going to really show everybody how individual that I am, and so I'm going to get like a tattoo, because I'm an individual. And you're like, well, at this point, in 2022, in the U.S., more people have tattoos than don't. So you're not really setting yourself apart in that way, shape, or form. I'm going to go and, you know, color my hair a certain way, and I'm going to go dress a certain way. Well, you didn't just pull that out of thin air. There are lots of people, right, who you pulled that from, and so you're like, I'm going to rebel in this way. I'm going to dress this way. But then you've got one and a half million other rebels that are dressing the exact same way and looking the same way. It's this myth of individuality that we can somehow extract our identity and meaning it apart from who we are in God. It's a trap that not only non-believers fall into, but many of us believers have been ensnared by it as well. We expend time and energy to the point of collapse in a desperate search for something that we've already been given. As Christians, meaning those who have believed in our hearts and confessed with our mouths that Jesus Christ is Lord, so if, you are, if you're going after Jesus, if you are a believer in Jesus, our identity is that we, like Jesus, are the beloved children of God. That's our identity. Nothing else has any significance. 
nothing else matters. You don't need to search for anything anywhere else. You don't need to try to find a way to, for self-expression. You don't need to do any of that stuff. It's already settled. You are the beloved children of God, and your job is simply to believe that and to live from that place. When we awaken to this reality, where we don't just know it, where we don't just say, oh, I get it, that's cool, yeah, we just sang how he loves, and that's cool. No, but when you actually believe it, when you don't just hear it, but you experience it, it can change your life in unimaginable ways. We can rest in him, in who we are, knowing that we have received grace upon grace and love beyond our ability to comprehend. We can rest knowing that he loves us not for something we have done or haven't done, but because he chooses to love us, because he chose to love us. And when we know that he loves us, and we really know that he loves us, then and only then can we love him in return. If you try to love God without knowing that he loves you, it will not take. It will not take. In fact, scriptures tell us we love because he first loved us. Our capacity to love, our ability to love, only springs from the fact that he has first loved us. If we don't get that, our capacity to love, our ability to love anybody in him, all in the same same thing, all linked together, it's basically impossible. You see, Jesus had done nothing up until his identity was confirmed and he received that blessing. But once this happened, man, what a shift took place in Jesus' life. John said at the end of his gospel that all the works that Jesus did could never be contained in all the world's books, which is a bit of hyperbole. But nothing for 30 years. And the blessing, identity. Jesus receives his identity. He knows who he is. And the world's forever changed as a result. So the question for this morning is this. Do you know who you are in Christ? Do you know that you are the beloved of God? Do you know that you are no longer a slave, but a son or a daughter? Do you know that you have been set free from striving to adhere to the code of the law in order to gain God's favor? Do you know who you are? Do you rest secure in your identity in Christ, that you are his beloved son, his beloved daughter, that you're no longer a slave to the fear of death. You're no longer a slave to sin. You're now free in Christ. Let's get back to the issue of identity. Because of the power of identity, the enemy will seek to rob us of it and or convince us that it simply isn't true. He uses the trick so often. Let's look what happens with Jesus immediately after his baptism. He receives his identity. He receives this blessing. And immediately, Matthew 4, 1 through 11, and I'm going to read through this whole thing because I want you to notice something that I'll point out at the end. Then Jesus was led by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. After fasting 40 days and 40 nights, he was hungry. The tempter came to him and said, If you are the Son of God... Tell all these stones to become bread. Jesus answered, It is written, Man shall not live on bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of God. Then the devil took him to the holy city and had him stand on the highest point of the temple. If you are the Son of God, he said, Throw yourself down, for it is written, He will command his angels concerning you, and they will lift you up in their hands, so that you will not strike your foot against a stone. Jesus answered him, It is also written, Do not put the Lord your God to the test. Again, the devil took him to a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their splendor. All this I will give you, he said, if you bow down and worship me. And Jesus said to him, Away from me, Satan, for it is written, Worship the Lord your God and serve him only. Then the devil left him and angels came and attended him. The enemy tempts Jesus, get this, the enemy tempts Jesus by trying to make, I'm sorry, by making him try and prove or earn something that, he's, that he already has. Man, I messed that up. Let me read it again. 
The enemy tempts Jesus by making him try and earn something that he already has. He says, if you are the son of God, then prove it by doing this. If you are the son of God, prove it by doing this. Do you notice something else in the enemy's temptation? You notice something a little bit different. The blessing that came from the father when Jesus was baptized said, father said what? This is my beloved son. This is my beloved son. When the enemy tempts Jesus, he says, if you are the son. He doesn't talk about the beloved part. He drops that. He leaves that out. He tries to skew things. He tries to manipulate it. He tries to kind of tweak it just enough, right? If you are the son, no, 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 no. I'm not just the son. I'm the beloved son of God. This is the same trick that the enemy used in the Garden of Eden. He tried to make Adam and Eve earn something that they already had. Genesis 3, 4 through 5, the enemy says, You will not certainly die, talking about the eat from the tree of the knowledge and good and evil. The serpent said to the woman, For God knows that when you eat from it, your eyes will be opened, and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. He's trying to make them earn something they already have. If you eat from it, you will be like God. They were already like God. They were already created in the image and the likeness of God. They already had full communion, full harmony, perfect relationship with God. This is the oldest trick, literally the oldest trick in the book. Right? You will, God, God knows that this will happen. No, 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 no. That's already who I am. I don't need Anything you have to offer. If you are the son, no, 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 no. I'm the beloved son. Here's the primary difference between the temptation of Adam and Eve and of Jesus, and this is key for today. Adam fell. We know that. And all of history has suffered as a result. But Jesus, who is referred to repeatedly in the New Testament as the second Adam, did not fall. He was obedient even to death on the cross. So what does that all add up to? You're like, that sounds great. I get it. Cool. Glad you didn't give in. That's good. But how does that affect my life? What does that have to do with what you're talking about today? Let's look at this passage in Romans. Romans chapter 5. This is Paul going in depth about what I've just talked about. And he's comparing and contrasting Adam and Jesus. And this is something that I... This is something that is missed so, so often that it drives me up a wall. This is one of the topics this morning that I'm most passionate about because it's so neglected and so often ignored, and I don't understand it because it's all through the New Testament. You cannot get around it, and this passage is, is so huge, and I think so many Christians have struggled and strained and just been discouraged for so much of their Christian lives. Like so many people, so many of you may be here this morning. Man, you have good hearts. You want to follow Jesus. Like you really, you're sitting there like, I know that he died for me. I know that like he's the way, the truth, and the life that no man comes to the Father. I know that his way is the best way. And I've been trying but you feel like you haven't made progress. You feel like you've been bogged down or you just feel terrible because no one's told you who you are. You've been sold a bill of goods by the enemy who is unfortunately, and I say this with as much humility as I can muster, but like unfortunately who's worked through the church to spread lies and doctrines of demons. And he's told you that you're just worthless pieces of garbage that you're just lucky to get in. And we're going to get to that in a second. But Paul makes it clear so many times this is just not true. And he's, he's exalting people to try to live the Christian life from a different place. And he understands that if you don't do this, it just is going to end in so much frustration and misery. And he talks about this in Romans, which is like his magnum opus. You know, He says, therefore, verses 12 through 17 in chapter 5, Therefore, just as sin entered the world through one man, so he's talking about Adam, and death through sin, and in this way, death came to all people because all sin. So we're like, yes, Adam was the father of, of the world, and he sinned, 
and sin entered the world, and now we are all subject and slaves to sin. To be sure, sin was in the world before the law was given. But sin is not charged against anyone's account where there is no law. Nevertheless, death reigned from the time of Adam to the time of Moses, even over those who didn't sin by breaking a command, as did Adam, who is the pattern of one to come, referring to Jesus. Now, this is where it gets so good. But the gift, he's talking about Jesus, the gift of Jesus not giving into temptation and dying for us in the resurrection, but the gift is not like the trespass. What Jesus gave us is not like the sin that Adam gave us. And you're like, wait a second. Like, the level of sin that Adam brought into the world through his mistake has been catastrophic. We're witnessing that right now, aren't we? We're seeing what's going on in Russia and the Ukraine. We had a tornado here last Sunday. There's all kinds of other crazy stuff. These shootings over at East High School. Sin has caused a lot of problems. And Paul, you have the audacity to say that what Jesus gave us as Christians is not it has a more profound effect on us than all that stuff that Adam gave us? Yeah, that's what he's saying. For if by many died, for if the many died by the trespass of one man, which we just talked about, how much more did God's grace and the gift that came by the grace of the one man, Jesus Christ, overflow to the many? If all that stuff that Adam brought caused that much, but the gift is not like the trespass. How much more powerful, significant, meaningful, life-changing, transformative, how much more powerful is the gift that Jesus gave us through the cross and the resurrection than what Adam brought us? That's crazy language, isn't it? How many of us think that way? Nor can the gift of God be compared. It can't even be compared with the result of one man's sin. The judgment followed one sin and brought condemnation, but the gift followed many trespasses and brought justification. It's a fancy word for saying when you, when you ask Jesus to come into your life that he does and that you're saved, you were justified. For if by the trespass of the one man, death reigned through that one man, how much more? He repeats himself. How much more? Will those who receive God's abundant provision of grace and the gift of righteousness reign in heaven? No. Where will they reign? In life. Through the one man, Jesus Christ. Paul's not talking about someday when we leave this place and go somewhere that will reign. We know that to be true. We absolutely know that to be true. What he's talking about is in the here and now that when we understand who we are, we receive our identity and we understand that, yes, Adam sinned and that caused all kinds of stuff, but what the work that Jesus did on the cross created a whole different opportunity and the two can't even be compared. When you realize that and step into it, it's amazing how free you suddenly are, how much joy you can suddenly have, how much peace you can suddenly have, how much the way that you live can transcend the circumstances around you. Through the cross, you've been set free from sin, from the law, from condemnation, from guilt, from shame, from fear. Through the cross, you've been brought near to God, and that is something to celebrate. This is a large part of what Jesus meant when he said, Come to me, all you who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. He's saying, for all of you that have been striving and straining and earning and trying to live up to the law and trying to achieve and trying to do all the stuff through your own effort, you're so tired. I honor your heart. I honor your intentions. Man, you're, you're so awesome. But it's so frustrating and you're so exhausted. Come to me. I love you. You don't have to prove anything to me anymore. You don't have to earn anything anymore because I've done all the work. Just come and rest in me and rest in who you are. If you believe in your heart and confess with your mouth that Jesus Christ is Lord, then you can rest in your identity as Jesus' brother, as his friend. We're told that we've been given the power to become children. The power to become children. The power to trust. The power to surrender. The power to lose 
are sometimes unbelievable levels of self-awareness and self-criticism and self-concern. The truth is that if you couldn't break yourself out of sin, right, we know that. For all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God, and we couldn't do it on our own. That's why we needed a Savior. If you couldn't break yourself out of sin, if you didn't have the strength to do that, what Adam started, then when you're in Christ, what makes you think that you can break yourself out of righteousness? You didn't get yourself into righteousness in the first place. Jesus did the work. You simply walked into it. And if you couldn't change the, the sin stuff that was going on, and that was just a pale in comparison to what Jesus did, what makes you think that because you mess up one day, somehow God's angry at you? What makes you think that because, you know, you had this struggle or had that struggle or whatever's going on, that somehow, oh my gosh, I can't, I'm sure God's just completely dismayed, completely beside himself, biting his nails. I can't believe they're doing this. can't break yourself out of righteousness. You are the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. The Apostle Paul actually says it in a, in a very interesting and unique way. He says that we are God's masterpiece. And he's not talking about us corporately, although he is. He's talking about us also individually. Individually. You, you are God's masterpiece. Here are some synonyms for masterpiece. Showpiece. Blockbuster. Whichever one you feel like applies to you the most, just take that one. Blockbuster. You are God's blockbuster. You are God's gem. You are his jewel. You are his prize. You are his treasure. I like this one for myself. You are his tour de force. I don't know. Just me, maybe. You are his magnum opus. You are his finest work. How often, when you wake up in the morning, is the first thought that goes through your head, Lord, I just thank you that I am your masterpiece. I thank you that I am your blockbuster. I thank you that I am your treasure, that I am your tour de force. I thank you that I am your finest work. And today, I know that I don't have to prove that to you, I can rest in my identity, but because I am your gem, because I am your jewel, I know who I am, and I'm going to go and just live like that. How often do you feel that way? How often does that thought come to your mind? Lots of us are incredibly good, incredibly good at a lot of internal negative self-talk, right? There's constant negativity in a lot of situations coming, but how often do you think this? That's what Paul's talking about when he says to be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Some of you think that you're, I'm just terrible. No, you're not. That's a lie of the enemy. Are you maybe living into everything that you should right now? Maybe not. But maybe a lot of it's because of this right here. Maybe if this is correct, maybe no one's ever told you, hey, and you are God's blockbuster. You are his masterpiece. You are his finest work. Quit trying to earn it and just settle in. God created all of nature, and I'm a huge nature nerd, right? I love any documentary on nature stuff. The old school planet Earth, remember those? And blue planet and anything. I mean, I, I watch that stuff endlessly. And nature is incredible, mountains and the seas and the forests and all these different creatures and all of the stuff, the stars, the galaxies, the universe, all these things. Think about all that in scope and think about in the midst of all of that beauty, all of that astounding creation that we are his masterpieces. Jesus' masterpiece. It's true. But here's the truth. One truth for this morning that maybe will help you in the midst of this. Masterpieces aren't created overnight. Right? If you think about the Sistine Chapel, think about the Mona Lisa, 
Think about the statue of Rocky. <laughs> Two weeks in a row with a random Rocky reference that wasn't in my notes. I don't know. You think about those things, right? They're not created overnight. And it's no different with us. So the Greek word that Paul uses for masterpiece when he says we're God's masterpieces, the Greek word that he uses is actually poema. P-O-E-M-A. Right? You are God's poem. He is writing you. It's not an overnight thing. We were created past tense, but the Bible says we are continually in the process of being created. He's still writing your story. Your story is not written yet. You are his masterpiece, and it's going to take us some time. You are his poem. And he takes great care to get every line right. God works on us this way because we're his beloved children. We're the work of his hands. We're his creation that he loves passionately, that he loves intimately, that he considered us, remember I talked about this last week, that he considered us worth spending eternity in heaven with. And if God loves what he created... Shouldn't we do the same? If God loves what he created, shouldn't we do the same? If it's true that the value of something is measured by what someone will pay for it, then many of us may need to rethink our worth this morning. If it's true that the value of something is measured by what someone will pay for it, then many of us may need to rethink our worth this morning. When you have a revelation of who you are, that you're his masterpiece, that you're a beloved son or daughter of the Most High God. Suddenly your mind is renewed. You see everything in a different light. You start operating from a place of love instead of performing in order to get love. You start talking to God differently during your prayer times. You don't feel shame anymore as you come to him. You approach the throne of grace with boldness and confidence. You ask for big things without second-guessing yourself or worrying about your motivation because you're probably not even that great of a judge of it anyway. So you just go before him and go, I'm a beloved son or daughter. You consider me worth the price of your son and you wanted to spend eternity in heaven with me. Man, that's amazing. So if that's true, I'm going to ask for big stuff and I'm not going to worry about my motivation or whatever it is. I don't know. You decide that. You know it better than me anyway. So I'm going to come to you because I'm not afraid to ask how many of you, when you had little kids, were they afraid to ask you for stuff? Like you get them a brand new thing, like Christmas comes, right? And they get like everything on their list. And then literally three days later, they're like, can I get, some, can I get this? Like you just got that stuff. But, and you're like, that's not great to give them everything they want. Don't get me wrong. But the point is there's a beautiful relationship there that there's no fear in how they approach you. Why? Because they know they're loved. Because they know that the worst thing that's going to happen is you're going to be like, ah, eh, let's not do that now, right? You start asking for big things. You pray for his kingdom to come here and now in radical ways in the lives of those around you and in the lives of people in this city in general. You read that you're receiving a, king, of a, receiving, excuse me, a kingdom that cannot be shaken, a holy inheritance, and you ask him if you might be able to make a withdrawal on that account right now. I know that you have a great place for us that you've prepared for us in heaven, but I'd like to see heaven come to earth in the here and the now. So I'm going to pray for this, and I'm going to pray for that, and I'm going to boldly go before the throne, and I'm, going to, I'm just going to act like I'm a son, like I'm a beloved son, I'm a beloved daughter. I know who I am, and I have no fear of approaching my father. When you do that stuff, just let me make it clear that God isn't offended by this request at all. In fact, he basically tells us that he wants us to ask this way. Luke 12 tells us that it's the Father's good pleasure, his joy, to give us the kingdom. And he's not talking again there at all. If you read it in context, he's not talking about some once and for all place in heaven. Although he's also giving us that, he's talking about in the here and now. Just like Paul said, how much more will you reign in life? And that's not a power over, like domination type of thing. What he's talking about is a life of prosperity of soul a prosperity of peace, a prosperity of healthy confidence because of who you are. 
The reason we do the things we do and we believe what we believe is because of who we are. It's that simple. The reason we do the things we do and we believe what we believe is because of who we are. It's that simple. You know, we had, uh, during our 21 days of prayer and fasting, on the very last corporate prayer night that we had here, uh, where we were together, we had a gentleman, Don Chapman, some of you guys know him, in, in our congregation who was, you know, dealing with some cancer diagnosis. And he asked if we'd pray for him, so about 25 of us got together and we laid hands on him. And Pastor Jordan asked myself and a couple other people to pray out loud specifically for Don. And if you were there that night and you had never been in a prayer situation like this, you may have been like, whoa, what's going on right now? Or a little bit confused because the way that I and the way that others prayed as well was something like this. Cancer, get out right now in Jesus' name. It was like cancer, go in the name of Jesus. Complete healing, complete all that kind of stuff. Scans, be clear, return, all that kind of stuff. It was bold, powerful prayers. And we're not afraid to pray prayers like that. Why? Because I know who I am. And I know that it's not about me on top of that. I know who Dawn is, and I know that he's God's beloved son, and that God wants to answer those kinds of prayers. Some people think, well, that's a little bit arrogant. That's a little bold. That's a little over the top. I'm like, no, it's not. You know, you know what's arrogant is to be self-protective and to pray, well, God, we're just, we're just a couple of bums down here. You know, we're just a couple of, like, we're trying, but we're not all that good. So if you could just throw us a bone. That's not knowing who you are. That's not consistent with the entire New Testament. What that's doing is self-protection in case Don isn't healed. That's more about you. But when you know who you are and when you're not afraid of that because you're not worried about how you're going to look, you're like, I already know who I am and I know what God's will is and I know what his heart is, you, you can be bold. And that's how we try to approach all that stuff. It's that simple. We didn't make ourselves like this. And that's the key. If we did, then we'd be arrogant. But Ephesians makes it clear, right, that we were once in darkness and we were slaves, right? It's by grace we've been saved, right? Through faith, it wasn't of ourselves that nobody can boast. So we're not doing anything saying like, oh, I, you know, I just got this power. I'm so good. No, all, we're, all we are is stepping into what our Father did for us in and through Jesus. That's all it is. What's the point? And there's some stuff here that, man, I could preach so many sermons on, but the reason you can walk in power, that you can walk in boldness, that you can walk in authority, that you can know who you are, is because your daddy is God. All right? When you act like God, you are simply being yourself. In fact, Paul commands us to be imitators of God. Well, what does that mean? Oh, I think it means to be imitators of God. When it says that we're being shaped and conformed and molded into the image and likeness of Jesus, what does that mean? Well, I think it means we're supposed to be like Jesus. Well, what did Jesus do? We're going to get to that in the next part of this series. But it's not something you're doing out of your own. You're just like, this is who my daddy is. I know who my daddy is, and he's got a lot of power and a lot of authority, and he's the you know, owner of a thousand cattle on a thousand hills, and like, he's got plenty of power and plenty of blessing to go around. He's not like Isaac where he blesses one and it runs out. No, there's sufficiency and then some. There's no lack. So when we expect to bring this back around, when we expect people to be healed, for example, I'm just using that as an example because it's fresh in my mind still. When we move in power and boldness and confidence and people say, what are you doing? I'm just acting like my daddy. I'm just acting like my brother Jesus. Because when I looked at how he prayed for people, he didn't even really pray for them. He was just like, be healed. <laughs> Demon, get out. So as he commanded the demons out with just a word, right? Well, I'm just trying to emulate him. But we've made all these different sort of like contingencies and stuff instead of just going after it. But when we do that, when we pray in power and boldness and confidence and we say we know who we are, it doesn't go over well with some people. Well, you know, we don't want to, we just, we don't want to build ourselves up too big. I'm just, I'm just a sinner saved by grace. You know, I'm just lucky to get in. That's what I am, just lucky to get in. Well, that's a weird way to act and to think when Paul says that we're God's masterpiece. That's a weird thing to do. That's actually not the gospel. It sounds good to human ears, but it's actually not the gospel. Well, that sounds good, but I'm only human. Well, actually, 1 Corinthians 2.16 says that you're not only human that you're not just human. There's no such thing. We have the mind of Christ. 
Paul says. We have the mind of Christ. You're not just human. You were never really just human, but if you were ever just human, it was before you were saved. But once you're saved, you're justified, and now you're in process. You're God's poem, you're his masterpiece, and you've been given the mind of Christ. You have not been given a spirit of fear or of, right, timidity or lack of confidence, but of power, of love, and of sound mind. Guys, this stuff is so huge, I can't even stress it. I mean, there's just no way to communicate how big this is. When you realize that you've got the mind of Christ, this might be a good one to take if you're taking a picture. When you realize that you've got the mind of Christ and you've been given the spirit of God, you lose the privilege of claiming I'm only human. Right? Romans 8 says, and this is part of that same diatribe I was talking about at the beginning. Paul says, the same spirit that raised Christ from the dead lives in us. So you've got the mind of Christ. You have the same spirit that raised Christ from the dead living in you. You're being conformed to the image and likeness of Jesus. You have Jesus who's always interceding at the right hand of the Father on your behalf. You've got angels around you. You're not just human. You're not. That, the idea of you only being human is a straight-up lie from the enemy. The idea that you're just a sinner saved by grace, that you're just lucky to get in, is a straight-up lie from the enemy. It is literally antichrist. He wants to keep you pressed down, Right? He wants to keep you thinking that because you will make no impact. Here's another truth. And we're getting ready to close here. We can no longer, we're at a point in time, and this is always true, but I think now it's so, so important. We can no longer afford to have, it's supposed to be the word A, I probably forgot that. We can no longer afford to have a thought in our head that's not his. We can no longer afford to have a thought in our head that's not his because if it's not his, what we're doing is making agreement with the enemy. We've got to think about ourselves the way that God thinks about us. We've got to think about ourselves the way that Jesus, our brother, our savior, our Lord, all these, that he thinks about us. If we don't do this, you're just going to be continually frustrated. God didn't save us, God, God didn't just save us from sin and death. That is, the, that is the one negative side of it. He saved us from something. He also saved us for something. He saved us for a life of beauty and power and purpose. Yes, he saved us from something, but he also saved us toward something. In our worst moments, when we wonder about our purpose and our value and our significance, in those moments, let's push back the voice of the enemy who's trying to make us feel worthless. And hear the voice of God saying, you are my masterpiece. You were created to bring a blessing to this world. You are my beloved in whom I am well pleased. Don't ever let go of that promise that you are God's masterpiece. Don't ever believe anything less about yourself. Your value has been set, past tense, has been set by your creator. And it cannot be changed. But when you make agreement with the enemy, it can suppress it, how you understand it. So let's stop that as of this morning. The heavens declare the glory of God simply by their existence, doing what, they may, doing what he made them to do, and so do you. Would you just bow your heads? If you're here this morning, you know, and you've been... Uh, if you've made agreement with the enemy's lies or if just no one's ever told you that you're his masterpiece, that you've believed all along, all of your Christian life, that you're just, again, a sinner, and that's your identity and that's all you'll ever be, I want to set you free from that this morning. It's literally something that would change your life in ways you could never imagine. So I'm going to pray here in just a second. But after I'm done and I say amen, I'm just going to ask that the... Uh, Sound guys would just play a little soft music. And if you want to stick around and receive prayer specifically for this thing, that you just, you just need someone to pray over you and just reaffirm that you're God's masterpiece, that you are his poem. I'll hang out here over on this side, and then I'll ask Pastor Lori if she'll stay and hang out over here on the right side. We're happy to pray for you. Stay here as long as we need to, so don't let time be an issue. Um, but yeah, just want to see people set free in this area. Jesus, we thank you 
that we love because you loved us first. I just pray for anyone here this morning that's in need of an overhaul, that's in need of a, a switch in their mindset as to their identity, that they would be set free this morning, that they would receive that, that they would not be shy about coming down and receiving prayer, that they would not let another day go by where they just think constantly about how bad they are, but that they would receive an impartation this morning, that they would receive a special blessing similar to the blessings in the Old Testament that's given to them that is their inheritance, that they would know who they are in you, that you're, they are your beloved son, they are your beloved daughter, that there's nothing else they need to do to earn your love, that if they have received you and welcomed you into their life, that they are secure. So Jesus, we just invite you now. You're already here, but Holy Spirit, just move in power. It's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen.